Hello and welcome to Hacks where we try to simplify cyber security. So I created my channel a while ago and I just started hacking things for the sake of hacking things. Now I know a lot of it is fairly simple like some of the basic hack website stuff but I realise that a lot of the people who come to my channel and watch my videos may not have like a foundation knowledge of cyber security or potentially even lots of computers for that matter. So I wanted to do a playlist as a sort of introduction 101 to hacking and I thought I'd start with a presentation on the sort of core fundamentals of hacking the legalities of it the hacking mindset who are hackers what are their motivations and how a successful hackers performed um, the series will go on to do more sort of involved stuff like setting up a virtual environment um, performing reconnaissance, uh, pulling off a successful exploit to get onto a system, um, getting persistence on a system and then clearing logs afterwards um, to clean up. But I thought the best way to start it would be with a presentation just so we can put a disclaimer in to say that we don't condone hacking in any way unless you own the system or have strict permission from the person who does own it. So without further ado, welcome to Hack to Learn and let's get started. So what is hacking? If you asked 10 different hackers what hacking was, you would probably get 10 different answers. Um, hacking can be taking bits of code and hacking them together. Hacking can be hacking into a computer system. Hacking can be hacking together a bunch of devices and repurposing them to do something else. Um, to pull it broadly, my my opinion on what hacking is, is understanding. It's understanding the purpose of a system. So in order to successfully hack something, it's best that you know what it is you're hacking and what its purpose is. So whether it's a domain controller, you need to know what a domain controller's purpose is on the network. Whether you're hacking into a web server, you need to know the fundamentals of what web servers are. Um, it's an important part, I feel, of hacking is, is understanding the purpose of what you're hacking. Then you need to understand the construction of what it is you're hacking. So you need to know how it's built. Now this can fall into like reconnaissance, understanding the technologies. So for example, if you did an MMAP scan on a on a host and you seen and you saw that it had port 80 and 443 open, you could determine that it was a web server. Or if it had 445 open, you could you could assume that it's a Windows box, potentially a domain controller uh, with SMB open. So understanding how something's constructed helps to uh, helps to, the more information you have about a system and how it's built the more likely you are to be successful in hacking it. So for like a web application, for example, knowing what language it's built with, knowing the backend database is, whether it's MySQL, MS SQL, Postgres, whether it's a NoSQLi database, or whether it has an API in the middle, knowing these, knowing the construction of something will make it easier to find vulnerabilities in it and successfully gain access to it. Then understanding the behavior of something. So, for instance, if you are trying to hack a web application and you're trying to perform an SQL injection on, say, a PHP site and you're popping a single quotation mark into the URL to see whether it's vulnerable to SQLi, um, knowing how the application is supposed to behave and how it behaves once you've added that single quotation mark could help you with a successful hack. For instance, if it gives you a 500 error, then you can assume or come to the conclusion that it is potentially vulnerable to SQLi injection. Whereas if you get a 404 error or like a different type of 200 error, you can assume that the database or the query is using prepared statements and is likely not vulnerable to SQL injections. So understanding, I feel, is the main 
concept of hacking. It's, it's understanding the systems to an intimate level so that you can analyze everything about them understand them and get them to behave in the way that you want them to behave so who is hacking well they tend to fall into three categories or at least that's what all the textbooks say um, white hat hackers gray hat hackers and black hat hatters hack hackers and their motivations vary depending on what, where they fall on the spectrum so white hat hackers tend to be your good guys. They can be security analysts, bug bounty people, um, bug bounty hunters, sorry. They tend to look for security vulnerabilities or, or they're employed to look for security vulnerabilities by a client. They do their best to find the bugs in a non-destructive manner and then they report them in a report to whoever... Con contracted them to find the bugs um yeah then you've got your gray hat hackers now again this this can this falls into both white hat and black hat territory um it could be someone who hasn't necessarily been given the permission of the owner of the product so for instance they could be just looking at a website out of their own curiosity and they find the bug in it and they decide they're gonna hack it but then they later report it to the to the person who owns the website saying, oh, we found this bug. And maybe they get a reward for it. The point is, is that they haven't really been, they haven't really gone about it legally. They haven't got a contract to say that they're able to hack it legally. They, they've gone out their own way, out of their own curiosity to do it. They may not have any sort of, nefarious motivations behind why they're doing it it could just be pure curiosity but those are your gray hat hackers and then we have the black hats which are the bad guys these are the hackers that do nefarious things usually out of a number of different motivations um these are the guys that the white hats try to protect networks and systems against. So when a white hat's been consulted to scan a, a network or a web application, it's usually to make sure that it's well protected from black hat hackers. And we can talk about the motivations of black hat hackers in the next slide. So why do people hack? Well, the motivations can vary greatly. So, as we were saying with the grey hat hackers, could just be curiosity. You know, they've they've heard about it, they've downloaded some tools. I would say sort of script kiddies fall into this curiosity as well as some of the other areas. But, you know, when I first started hacking, it was out of curiosity. I downloaded some tools, had a go, was pretty terrible at it. But it was curiosity that drawed me in. You know, it sounded fascinating. Then we've got activism. So activism can be political activism, usually is. If there's somebody, if there's people in oppressed countries and they want to speak out about their government, they can hack their websites and deface it. Probably quite a lot of this going on now with the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Um, again, it has. it's usually to send a political message um, out to the people. If you've got a government that you don't agree with, then you could hack and deface their website to leave a political message. Uh, again, not condoning it, but it's a very valid point of getting a very, a very powerful way of getting your point across. I believe in some countries it's even legal to perform denial of service attacks as a form of protest, but don't quote me on that. And then you've got good old revenge. Um, revenge hacks can be spices or. People who, for instance, have been dumped by somebody, they go onto their Facebook, hack it just to check their messages and things like that. It could be disgruntled employees. If you've recently been let go of a job and you still have access to the network, um, Darknet Diaries has got a great episode on this where somebody uh, still had access to their network and they downloaded data and sold it on the Darknet for financial gain. Which brings us into the main one, I believe, which is money or financial gain. Um, so things like ransomware um, or um, there was like a, a malware tool called Zeus, which allowed people to rob people's bank accounts. 
normally this is the way this is the motivations behind hacks is money because there's a lot of money to be made by hacks by hacking um and that tends to be a lot of people's yeah reasons why i mean if you can make a lot of money hacking stealing crypto or anything like that and you've got no sort of morals or hold-ups about it then why why not eh? but there we go so how do you hack well successful hacks they tend to follow a pattern um each step of the hack tends to affect the success of the next step so performing each step as detailed and as good as possible can help you with the next step for instance when you're performing reconnaissance you can use tools like Maltigo or the Harvester to gather as much information about a domain or a company as possible. You can scrape LinkedIn profiles, search Google using Google Docs for subdomains or other parts of the global domain that may not be as secure as their main site. Um, so you could have Google.com, but then they've got a subdomain of beta test.google.com which may not be as secure as the main site you may find outdated software on there or vulnerabilities on there that could allow you to get in and get a foothold into the network um yeah that's the reconnaissance phase that's more of a passive style engagement then you've got scanning which is more of your active information gathering this can be done by using tools like nmap um and it allows or nessus uh, um, open vast this again that's quite noisy but this is your active information gathering stage you will scan a box to find out what ports are open and what services are listening on those ports and see if any of them are outdated or vulnerable um, scanning web applications using tools like burp suite or zap web app proxy or nicto it could allow you to find um, potential SQL injections that you know could get allow you to retrieve credentials which can be used somewhere else on the site like on the admin login portal and once you're into the web application perhaps you can spawn a shell which will get you onto the box so that's that's like sort of a scanning phase which then brings you into obviously gaining access um, again as I said you once you've scanned the site and found the vulnerabilities you then need to exploit them so if you're on a network and you find that you've got an outdated Windows system which isn't patched, you may find that it's uh, vulnerable to Eternal Blue. So you use an exploit. Um, there are some tools out there like Metasploit which make it really easy for you. And you use that to launch an attack against the target and gain access to it. And then you've got maintaining access or persistence. And what this is, is once you've gotten into a system... Um, you can then try to laterally or vertically elevate your privileges or, you know, change your privileges by like migrating to a different process um, and finding a way to create some sort of backdoor or some way back into the system. So you could create a reverse shell that sends a connection back to your machine every five minutes. Um, again, that's probably not so subtle, but there are other ways to do it. And then we have cleaning your tracks. So this will be going in and doing things like deleting your log files to make sure that nobody can track it down to your IP address. Again, this, this varies. If you've gone in through firewalls and switches, there are logs there. And it's going to depend on their auditing policy about how much you have to do. You know, they could be logging absolutely everything. Um, successful logins, failed logins, changes in group policy. So it's very important if, if you are trying to remain undetected to clear your tracks. And then that brings us on to whether or not hacking is legal. Well, no. Um, so if you are a cybersecurity consultant and you have a uh, rules of engagement and you've, you've signed a scope and they've signed off on it, then yes. You know, as long as you've got explicit permission from the person who owns the product, which you have to be careful with because a lot of clients could have... Um, websites or other services in third-party providers like azure aws google cloud and 
you know, if you're hacking into that, you need to get permission from those third-party providers first. But there are laws, especially in the UK, which tell you, um, essentially, if you're being a malicious actor, they define the sort of jail time you will get and how seriousness the crime is. So, for instance, unauthorised access to computer material. Now, this could be anything, really. This could be confidential information. So, information has a number of different categories from client confidential to top secret and if you access if you have access to or own this material um, without the express permission of whoever created it then you could be in violation of this um, this law which could result in jail time or a fine um, unauthorized access with intent to commit or facilitate commission of further offenses so this could be you've gained access to a system and you've set up persistence and you intend to commit further offenses or give somebody else access to the system to commit further offenses again it could result in prison time or a fine unauthorized acts with intent to impair or with recklessness or as to impairing operation of a computer so this is a scary one for all cyber security consultants because it could be by accident. I mean, it says with intent to impair or with recklessness. So you could be being reckless and you could be brute forcing a web application or something like that and you cause the box to fall over. And this would violate one of the three foundations of cyber security. Um, you've got um, confidentiality, availability, and integrity. See, I, sorry, the other way around. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And if, if you cause a box to fall over, you've jeopardized the availability of that box. Um, and again, you know, if, if you cause financial damage to an organization because you've accidentally knocked something over, there is a potential, even if you signed an agreement, however unlikely that you could face criminal charges. Normally, You've got lawyers or solicitors and things like that to protect you, but there's always that risk there. Um, but if you're a nefarious actor and you're performing denial of service attacks or you've gone in and you've just damaged the whole system to make it inoperable, this is the category that you will fall under, which again could result in prison time or a hefty fine. Unauthorized acts causing or creating risk of serious damage. Um, this is one of the new sort of laws that have been brought in when they revised the computer misuse act um so this could be like an iot device that you hack um it could cause damage to somebody else or risk of life again it can cause jail time or a heavy fine uh, making supplying or obtaining articles for use in offense under section one three or three za so computer material this could be Document this again. It's a broad spectrum. This could be documentation about how to hack things. Um, this could be malicious programs. It's it, it's a broad area which gives governments a lot of power. But I'm sure if it's just for educational purposes, it's fine. But yeah, um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I hope it's been informative. Let me know what you think. And next time we will be downloading and setting up a virtual environment for us to test out our hacking completely legally. Kind regards. See you next time.